into this church. Now, let me tell you what's, what we're kind of on because we're kind of at a new you know, launching point in many things for us uh, as the church preaching. On Sunday morning, I'm doing doctrinal studies, Bible class doctrinal studies. This is to build you up and establish you in the faith and doctrine. We've already been through several issues. We've got lots of them to go. And uh, that's what we're doing on Sunday morning Bible class, trying to get people rooted and grounded in the faith so that you know what you believe and why you believe it. That's what that's about. I, I had really honestly never done that before, and I, and I needed to do, do it, and, and I'm enjoying it. Hope you are in, enjoying it. But there's a lot of things. You need, you need to deal with situations like, the, like we've dealt with the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. And all these doctrines are important. And that's how people get blown out of the water. Some cult comes knocking on the door, gives them a verse, and we don't know how to answer or respond to it. And then we think, well, maybe I don't have the truth. Now, you know, and so people need to be taught doctrine. Paul distinctively told Timothy to teach doctrine. Doctrine will keep you from getting blown out of the water. Doctrine simply means what the Bible teaches about an issue or subject or, or whatever, okay? On Sunday mornings, I start preaching through Nehemiah. Now, for years and years, I've preached through people's lives or preached, preached through books. And I like doing that because it's the whole counsel of God. I, I, yeah, I'll jump out and preach something every once in a while. That's just an arbitrary message. Maybe the Lord led me. I almost did tonight. Almost preached a message that I've had laid up for months. I was all excited, but just, I mean, to the last moment, God just said, nope, 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 nope. Sometimes it seems like in preaching, God just wants to see if you would do what he says to do. He's not having you do it, but he just wants to see if you would do it. And tonight, I'm going to start preaching through the epistles. We're going to start on 1 Corinthians, and we're going to work our way through the epistles. So if you see what I'm doing, I'm, just, I'm trying to get us in the Old Testament, New Testament, doctrinal things, uh, biogra biographical, you know, stuff, and always trying to center everything about Jesus Christ, because he is the subject of this book. And so the Bible says, feed the flock of God, which is among you. And people need to be fed the word of God. We need evangelistic preaching, but we need feeding preaching. We need pastoral teaching. And, those, and that's what happens. And that, let me just say something to it again. I, I am so grateful for uh, the faithfulness of the church because in, I'm just telling you in all honesty, uh, to get that, you know, I can't do all that in one service. I can't do that in one deal. And so it, it, I encourage you to be faithful to the services because faith is built gradually over the years. It's just like your kids sitting down at the table. They don't grow five inches in one meal. But it's meal after meal after meal after meal, day after day. Here a little, there a little. And that's the way it works with your spiritual growth. So it's possible that you can go to, and this is what's happening across America. In fact, I've just been reading recently, there are preachers that are very, very concerned about what we call the emerging church issue. And here's why. Because the people are having worship services they're not being taught anything. They don't have a clue what they believe. It's just that some, it's some, some kind of Jesus they came to worship who really goes along with everything they want to do in life. He has no problem with anything they would decide to do or way they decide to live. He's a real nice Jesus. He's just kind of a putty, little putty Jesus. And they're concerned because they're saying this, what they're seeing is, and I, and I agree with them, they're backing up and saying 10 years, 20 years from now, we're going to have a whole generation of not lost people, but church people who are going to be so vulnerable to the Islamics, all the cults, because they don't know anything. And they don't need to have a Bible in their hand that they can honestly say, thus saith the Lord, this book is true. And they're saying they're, they're, we're being set up to be totally disintegrated as, as, a, as, a, as a movement of God. And that's tragic. That's pretty sad. So anyway, that's why I'm doing that. And, and you know, here's another thing. I'm going to give an account. You just think about it. I'm, I don't know. I got two brother. Danny said he was 63. I thought I was, I thought Danny was older than I was, but he's not. I thought he was a year or two older than I was. I'm a year or two older than he is. Brother, brother Danny, I want to say something tonight just about brother Danny and sister Connie. I'll just, I, I say this, Justin, Bible says, give honor to whom honors do. But you know, they've been faithful and you notice their, their kids are in church. Their kids are grown, bringing their kids to church. You ought to kind of watch that a little bit. I'm not trying to break because what they are, they're just like me or you, or him, but they're what, are what they are by the grace of God. But at the same time, you need to look at that. You need to appreciate that. You know, I mean, they're, they're just as sorry as any the rest of us. Is that right? Maybe worse. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, we need to encourage each other, that's about each other. And, but here's the thing about Danny and I. He's 63, I'm 64. All right, let's say 10 years down the road, I'm going to be 74. He's going to be 73. 
We don't know where the Lord will take us out between now and then. He might take us out this week. Might take, but if I live 10 years, 20 years, don't make a difference. Short, quick. In just a few years at the most, man, I'm telling you, if the, if the next 20 goes by as fast as the last 20 have, uh, this thing gets on a downhill slide with grease underneath it. Amen. And I'm going to be giving, watch this. I'm going to be giving account to God for pastoring this church. This is my call in life. This is where God has placed me, has put me. And I'm going to give an account as an under shepherd. And the main thing he's, there's two or three things. It's required in stewards that they be faithful. You got to be consistent. Got to be steady. Got to keep going through the storms, keep going through the trials, through the, the, the biggest storms for me are not what happens, you know, among congregation or what's happening in the United States right in here. The, 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 the greatest danger I have of faltering or failing in the work of God is not keeping my body under subjection. Paul said, lest I also be cast away. That's what'll get you. I'm not worried about all these external storms. You know, people come, people go. That's just been going on for 36 years. Okay. I've learned to accept that. But the living, you know, living with myself and my own failures and my own failure, that's, that's the biggest struggle. So that's why you need to pray for me that I'll be stay that way and, and not get blown out of the water. But I'm going to give an account to God for uh, faithfulness, but then secondly, for having he, to feed the flock of God, to preach the word of God. And I'm telling you, that's no small thing. This big book from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is a big book. A lot of subjects. Your lives involve so many things. And it takes, and I go back to the founding of this nation in the 1700s before our Constitution was written, before the Declaration of Independence, before the Revolutionary War. The average, the 80% the of American pastors stayed at one church their entire life. 80% of the pastors of America, they went to pastor one church as a young man and they stayed until they died. And this country was birthed out of that kind of spiritual movement. In America right now, pastors are staying an average of 2.1 years in a church. And there is no way under God's green earth you're going to feed a congregation of God, the word of God, the whole counsel of God, stay in 2.1 years. It ain't happening. There's another side of that. You can't stay in a church 2.1 years and get it either. No more than a pastor can stay 2.1 years and get it. Now, these are serious issues. They're big things, but they need to be discussed, need to be talked about. Your kids need to hear this. They need, they need to have this planted in their heart. And we need to get back when we're talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the walls that we started this morning. This is part of rebuilding the walls. This is part of rebuilding the walls. Pastors ought to have some guts, some backbone, and some love for their people and love for the Bible, love for the Word of God. Say, you know what? As long as God tells me to be here, I'm going to be here. It's real easy to say, oh, God, move me. That's easy to say. Better watch that one. Because the you know, pressure gets on and you know, stuff like that. It's, it's easy to say that. And, and I'm like a lot of preachers say every, every Monday morning, I want to quit and move somewhere. Because I drive home a lot of times thinking, well, that didn't work out very good. I didn't do a very good job, you know. And that, you know, it's just like, you know, you just feel like, I mean, I'm just telling the truth. You just feel like a failure about three quarters of the time. But it's not about that. It's not about whether, it's not about me. It's about whether I preach the word of God or not. And then the Holy Spirit takes from there. But Satan tries to focus it back on, well, you should have said that. You shouldn't have said that that way. Or you should, you know, and I can do that on and on. But there's no point in that. It doesn't get you anywhere. So what I'm saying is, this is, I'm just kind of saying this tonight to get us lined up. I'm preaching on Nehemiah, on Bible preaching, doctrinal things on Bible class. And Sunday nights, I want to preach, hopefully preach through epistles. And boy, I'm telling you, it's good. So we're going to take off here in the book of Corinthians. And before we start taking off verse 1, and that's going to go verse by verse, so you just have your Bible there. But the city of Corinth is a real city. It was, it's on the northern side of the Mediterranean Sea. The Apostle Paul had walked into this town, began preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, had led many people in this town to Christ. And he's writing back now to this church in the city of Corinth a lot of things that they're dealing with. Now, I'm going to give you some things about Corinth. In verse number one, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenius, our brother, under the church of God, which is in Corinth. Now, there's two things there. You got the church and you got Corinth. Hmm. <laughs> you've got the church and you've got Corinth. Now I want to give you some things tonight. The city of Corinth was known for its commerce, but the church was known for its Calvary. Corinth was known for its filth. 
but the church ought to be known for its faith. Corinth was known for its business world, but the church is known for its believers. Corinth was known for its pleasure, but the church is known for its purity. Corinth was known for its worldliness, but the church ought to be known for the word of God. Corinth was known for its superiors and its slaves, but the church was known for its saints. Corinth was founded by Caesar, but the church was founded by Christ. This was a port city. I've been there personally. I've been at Corinth. It's kind of a tourist place now. But the city of Corinth was a port city. It actually has two ports. It was a humongous trade city at the time the Apostle Paul went in there. Caesar had it rebuilt because of his political and military strategic areas and his commerce areas. Corinth at that time had what we call the Olympics now. They had called the Ithamus Games. And uh, they were held there. And it's kind of like what you and I'd call the Olympics now, except it was very much more perverse. But those games brought people in from across the Mediterranean, around the world. They brought them in. People, nations and countries and cities would send their athletes into Corinth for these massive games that they would have, somewhat like you would think about the Olympics today. I've literally seen this place. There was a temple out there in the harbor. The Temple of Raphrodite, I guess that's the way. It's A-P-H-R-O-D-I-T-E, Aphrodite. It had a thousand constantly consecrated prostitutes in this temple, the Temple of Raphrodite. And men and people from all over the world, and you can't imagine the perverseness, but they came in there. See, there's something they knew, that if you provided the sensuality, all the garbage, it would draw the people in. So when they were coming to do business, they could come for pleasure, okay? It was a sin-sick city. It was, um, it was basically a, you know, I say, you say, Reggie, what are you saying all this for? I want you to get the setting of the book we're getting ready to look at. I want you to get the reality of the place Paul was preaching. Now, there's something massive in this. Corinth was a lot like San Francisco is today. There is so much correlation between Corinth and San Francisco, it's unbelievable. San Francisco is a port city. San Francisco has super rich people and it has super poor people. Let me tell you why California is about this immigration deal. Let me tell you what it's really about. There are vineyard owners out there. There are huge farmers that grow the vegetables that you eat at your supermarket. California is an amazing state. And these super rich people, Silicon Valley people and all this stuff, and these San Francisco people who have amassed great amounts of wealth are want the cheap Mexican labor to clean their dishes, vacuum their houses, mow their lawns. You listen to this preacher. It's the same type of thing. This is wild. Today came out that there are liberals right now calling for a civil war because they're afraid that they cannot regain power politically through the ballot box. Now, this is today. There are major Democrat liberal politicians calling for a civil war. Okay? Okay. And it's amazing to me that it's the same party that started the Civil War in 1861. And it was started on the same basis. Now listen to me good. You had the slave owners and you had the slaves. You basically got almost the same thing out there now. They don't pay those people nothing because they don't make money in Mexico, but they feel like they're making something good now. But you, what you have in San Francisco, same thing you had in Corinth. You had this super rich society and you had the slave society. In fact, let me tell you how bad it was in Corinth. Corinth was known for its bronze foundries. And there were people in, in Corinth who had an amazing secret formulas for gold, silver, and bronze. How to make, because like if you've got a quarter today, it ain't all silver, right? And there is big, big, humongous money in the monetary coin business if you know what you're doing. And these people had these bronze foundries, and listen to me, down inside the earth in the mines were these slaves. They were literally colonies of them, and they never saw the light of day in their life. But the rich Corinthians promoted them having lots of kids so they could keep the, the slaves supply up. Many of those people never, they literally breathed that sulfur, breathed all that junk and that poison in them and they died young. And they, some of them lived there, were born there down in those dungeon living quarters and they never saw the sun in their life. 
That's how bad this place was. Paul walked, and here's what, here's what I want to encourage you tonight. The Apostle Paul walked into a city like that, and I don't know where he went, Brother Phil, Brother Ralph, but he walked in somewhere and he started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because he knew something. It had the power of God to save people. And he started a church in a city like San Francisco. Are you listening to me? Now, if you read your Bible, the book of Acts, you'll find out that he was stoned. He was everything. Rocked. I mean, tell you what, this guy was willing to die for the faith, but he preached the gospel and he established a church in this city. Now, here's what I'm going to get to. I love the country. I love living in the Ozarks. I kind of look at it this way. One of the reasons I preach so hard and preach like I do and try to take the stand I do, I'm trying to build, you know, I like, let's, let's retain the territory we got. Let's don't give in to the, the, the wicked. Let's keep, let's keep our Ozarks good. And that's okay, but that's not really what Paul had. Paul had an offense. You see, you can stand on your end of the ball court all your life, but if you don't ever go down and make a basket, you ain't going to win no games. And what God is calling this generation to is, is Nehemiahs who go build the walls, who leave their sh palace of Shushan, that luxurious life of a high-class slave, and go build the re re walls, rebuild the walls of truth and righteousness and holiness and the, law, the walls of God's laws and so forth. And God's looking for the people that will be Apostle Paul's. We wonder, well, how did they turn the world upside down? I'll tell you how they did it. Because they had men like the Apostle Paul who'd walk into a city like San Francisco and stand on the corner and start preaching and giving the gospel. Being willing to be thrown in. Where, where did Paul write a lot of his epistles at? Can they help me? Most of them from a prison cell. Most of them from prison and I'm telling you, this is what, how many believes right now, how many knows right now that if you went to San Francisco and got on the street corner and started preaching the Bible, you'd probably have arrested. And so I'm, I'm saying this now, this is, I, I've said all this, this is the setting. Unless you get this setting about this book, I mean, it just doesn't mean as much to you as it would. Now, Paul walked in here and when he preached the gospel, let me tell you what happened. There were rich people that got saved and there were slaves that got saved. There were merchants that got saved. There were farmers that got saved. There were factory workers that got saved. Now watch this. And he had all these different classes of all these people in Corinth that had gotten saved and responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now he's writing a letter to these people. Now the Bible, this book is, is like a, a mountain range. And every once in a while, there'll be a peak come up. It's like you go out in the Rockies and you'll see these peaks. In this book, there's a peak. It's called 1 Corinthians 13. The chapter of charity. When you get to Hebrews chapter 11, it's a mountain peak. I mean, they're all the way through. There are these peak chapters. And, and, and then this book is one of them. And I'm telling you right now that everything that you and I believe about Christianity and what we're dealing with right here in our church and in our homes and in our families the remedy for it is in this book right here, the problems of life that we have about being Christians. Paul dealt with, every chapter dealt with all kinds of problems. You can imagine in this book. And if you want to stand the storm and you want to, you want to see your children, you want to see your family 50 years now serving God, you really need to get a hold of what he's getting ready to do here. So uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's, it, was a, it was a refined culture, but it was a wretched culture. I mean, San Francisco is a refined, cultured city, but it's wretched. It was pornographic. It was perverted. And it was into this corrupt, slimy, slick, sickening sewer lagoon of depraved humanity that Paul walked in and started preaching the gospel and people got saved. And that's what we've got to do. And I, with all my heart, I believe this. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm revived in what, I mean, you probably picked it up this week. I was so, I was so encouraged to see a 31-year-old boy. Memorizing the word of God, preaching the word of God, not caring about what anybody thought about it, but still doing it with a smile on his face and a happy heart. Amen. I wished I had that. <laughs> I wished I did. Let's take off tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are entering into a sacred territory in the book of 1 Corinthians tonight. God, unless you get in this thing, all I could say would be of no value to these people. But Lord, I know tonight that the Holy Ghost will be our preacher. And Lord, preach to our hearts, Lord. And there's value here. There's, there's tremendous things, Lord. <coughs> that this world can't ever teach us. We, we, we could go to school till we went to every college in this state and never learn what's in this chapter right here. 
God, I pray tonight that you'll illuminate our minds, that you'll fill us with your spirit, that you'll guide us and direct us and keep us. And Lord, I pray that this will be a deep value and wondrous value to the families and the homes of this church. And to my life, God, I pray, help us, Lord, in our business, our work, our families, our marriages, everything we do. Help us, Lord, to take it with us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to give you just a little testimony this morning. I want you to pray about something. I had a visitor at church this morning. This lady came and talked to me about an auction. And uh, I'm telling you the other day, but I want you to pray for her and because uh, she just doesn't know anything about it. Doesn't know anything. And we're going to get her a Bible. She came to church, didn't have a Bible this morning. We're going to get her a Bible. And boy, my heart goes out to her. She came home and ate dinner with us today, and we had a great time. And she has, she's born in Japan, came over here in 1982, uh, married an American serviceman. And um, uh, she is the only daughter, and she has no children. And she's a widow, been widowed five years now. Doesn't have anybody in this world. Doesn't have a daddy, mama, no sisters, no brothers, no nothing. And you know what I want? I want this church to show her the love of God. Amen. I want this church to show her the love of God. And I, you know, wanted real bad. To, I mean, I've already given her the gospel, you know, and I want so bad to sit down at a table and take the Bible and just let her read and, and so forth. But you pray God will give us that opportunity. But I want to tell them, I was kind of shocked, and this is kind of funny. Uh, I, I was at her place, and she lives way back in the country. And I, I left, I got in the truck, and the Holy Ghost just quickened me and said, Reg, you did not talk to that woman about the gospel. And I said, Lord, I, you know. So I fish out a track, and I pull back up there, and I give it to her. And I could tell when I talked to her, she didn't have a clue what I was talking about. She didn't have the foggiest idea. Of what, and I mean, I was telling her about Jesus dying on the cross and being buried and rose again. She didn't have the foggiest. When I said, have you ever been saved? She didn't have the foggiest clue about what do you mean? It's like, what do you mean be saved? And then she finally grinned at me and said, I don't do religion very well. <laughs> My heart just, and I thought about this only daughter born in Japan, way over here in southern Missouri. The sovereign grace of God wants to reach down and save that woman. And uh, I want us all to get a burden for the lost. I want, us to, I want us to care more about people being saved than we do about being offended. And Paul's going to deal with a lot of that in this book right here. He's going to, this church was having a lot of problems. It has the same problem. Every church in the world has the problems this church here at in Corinth. Anyway, here we go. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenius, our brother, unto the church of God, which is a Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm just going to preach as I go through here. He said, he said I've been called. He said, I was called. He said, and I was by the will of God. And he said, uh, he said those that are sanctified in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, here, what are you talking about? Sanctified in Jesus Christ. He's talking about that you have been saved and set apart in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm telling you something right now. This is a wonderful, wonderful truth. Why was Paul telling it? I'm going to tell you. There's a big reason, Paul, the Holy Ghost started off with this right here. And the reason was these are very, very carnal people. To be honest with you, in a certain way, this church, you people, you families, you're light years ahead of where these people were because they just were, they were saved out of such a carnal, wicked. Can you imagine living in a wicked Sodom and Gomorrah, San Francisco type area, and you don't know nothing about the Bible, but you heard the gospel and you believed on it. But you got a lot of carnal problems. You got, and by the way, don't you know in here, there was incest going on in the church. There was everything in the world going on in this church, if you know anything about the book of 1 Corinthians. They didn't know that stuff going on. You'd go, good land, how could they even be saved and do that? You know what Paul's telling them? He's saying, listen, <clears throat> he said, you're sanctified in Jesus Christ. He is establishing the security of their salvation right off the bat. He said, you're not sanctified in how well you're performing. You're not sanctified in how uh, good you're doing. You're, you're not sanctified in how smart you are and how all this. He said, you're sanctified in Jesus Christ. He's talking about their positional sanctification that they're in Christ. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you here tonight, I want to ask you, was Paul any more saved than you are? <laughs> you know I, what I like about the cross? It's level ground for everybody. Amen. Amen. Now, here's, I'm going to give you something sweet tonight. Paul, right out the gate, Paul is dealing with a spiritual doctrinal truth. That irregardless of their problems and all the junk they had going on in the church and among their families and people... If they were saved, they were saved in Christ and sanctified in Christ, and there wasn't any difference in them. I want to ask you, how many of you are just as saved as D.L. Moody was? Get this. If you're saved, you're just as saved as anybody's ever been saved. Get it. Get it down. Get it settled. In Christ. We are one in Christ. It's not in again in our 
doctrinal distinctions and all this kind of stuff. Everybody in this church out to saved is just as saved as the other person is. And all these great who you know, how many thinks you're just as saved as Billy Graham? He's not more saved than, he wasn't, D.L. Moody wasn't more saved than you are. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Wouldn't that kind of help you along the trail once in a while when you've messed up and you feel like, man alive, I'm gonna be, I've got to be number one Saras Christian country once in a while. I get to think of that way. Do you know what? It's in Christ that I'm sanctified in Christ. I'm set apart unto Christ. I'm set apart unto God in Jesus Christ. Well, I'll get off of that there in just a minute. But anyway, he said, called to be saints. <clears throat> called to be what? Saints. Now, we got a habit of saying, well, I'm just no sinner saved by grace. That's true, but you're also a saint. And sometimes if you're not careful, you'll use that phrase, a sinner saved by grace, to say, well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Kind of becomes an excuse for sinning. Kind of becomes an excuse for not living right. Paul said, you are called to be saints. And saints are a people set apart. They're sanctified in Christ. They're saved people and they're saints. And people used to call it people the saints. Now, I've got a friend, in fact, he's preached here before, brother down there in Arkansas. And uh, he's all the time when he's preaching saying, now saints. And he'll say, now saints. And now saints. And that's good. You know why? Because it causes people to think, I am a saint. And I should, if I'm a saint, I ought to act like a saint. Oh, when the saints, not when the sinners saved by grace go marching in, but when the saints go marching in. And he's just laying some things out. He said, yes. He said, he said, I know we got a lot of problems. We're going to deal with them. But he said, you're sanctified in Christ. And he said, you've been called to be saints. And you walk out. I mean, can't you just imagine here's St. Connie. And there's St. Dean. And there's St. Kenny. Is that true or not? And you know what? If we look at each other as saints, it might change the way we look at each other. Hmm? That is a biblical term for the people that are saved of God. Saints. You know, you know what's ruined it? Does anybody know what's ruined it? Catholic Church. Saint Teresa and Saint so-and-so and Saint so-and-so. And they're supposed to be some kind of whoopy law deal or something that's beyond the human realm. And it's all garbage. They're no more saint than you are. In fact, they're probably not a saint. To be honest about it. But we're sa if you're saved, you're a saint. Look at your wife tonight before you go to sleep. Say, good night, saint. <laughs> hey, that sainthood is not in how good you are. That sainthood is in Christ. He is our righteousness. And boy, he's going to get into this. And my being a saint is not about how good Reggie did last week. It's about what Jesus did on the cross for me. It's about who I am in Jesus Christ. That's a blessed thought. Boy, you talk about blessed. No wonder Fanny Crosby could say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. He said, it's called to be saints. And by the way, in the first 10 verses, now I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to show you how to preach. I don't know that much about it, but the Bible will tell you. In the first 10 verses, he's going to mention Jesus Christ nine times. That tell you anything? Preeminent. Preach Christ. Keep him right in the center of everything. You, you check your Bible out. First 10 verses, he's going to mention Jesus. Not just, he mentions, actually he mentions Christ more if you take everything in, but just the name of Jesus nine times in the first 10 verses. I think he's preaching about Christ. I think he's telling this church, you're going to get Christ centered in your life. Okay, here we go. He said, uh, call a place, he said, call to be saints with all that in every place. <clears throat> well, I didn't know there's any other Christian beside us. Did you? I thought only Christians was in Norwood, Missouri. <laughs> in all places. Hey, there's folks saved in San Francisco tonight. Don't you doubt it. But anyway, he said, he said to call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I'm going to say something to you tonight. And this, and this is, I don't know, I hate to even bring it up because it just gets to be a deal. But there's this deal about lordship salvation. Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay. Y'all ever heard of this? You have to get, you, you, you get around and say, well, if you haven't made him Lord, you're not saved. Well, he's Jesus the Lord. So to me, I got the whole package. 
But, and what they're dealing with, there's some substantiation of what they're dealing with. They're saying, some people are saying they want Jesus but they don't, as a Savior, but they don't want him as Lord. And you can't have him as a Savior without having him as Lord. I, there's, a certain, there's truth to that. But then, you get to, then they get to defining, well, what does it mean to make him Lord? So there's where the trouble comes. All right? And I'll just be honest with you. Don't let yourself get bogged down in that. Don't let yourself get bogged. That's another one of the deals we talked about in Sunday school class this morning. Don't get bogged down in that. Just take the Bible for what it says. He is Lord. And whether, and whether I make him Lord or not, quote, he is Lord. Me making him Lord doesn't make him Lord. He's Lord. But there is a great truth here that we need to see him as the Bible presents him, not just as Jesus the Savior, but as Jesus the Lord. Now watch this. If he is Lord, what does that mean? He's the master. He's to be obeyed. Power. Submission. Lord. Even as Sarah calling Abraham, Lord. Mm, authority. Structure of authority. He's the head of the church. Christ is. He's the Lord. He's the head of your business. What's the He's to be the head of your marriage. He's to be the Lord of your family. He's to be the Lord of your children. He's to be the Lord of your money. He's to be the Lord of everything. He is Lord. What the problem I have with that Lordship salvation deal is they'll kind of say, well, you haven't made him Lord in every area of life. Well, I don't make him Lord of anything. I mean, I, I can submit he's Lord anyway. But they kind of do this deal. It's kind of like the tongues deal. Well, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not really saved. If eventually you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. If eventually you haven't made him, quote, Lord of your life, well, you're, you, he's not Lord. He's, he's not your Savior. It's just junk. Don't get bogged down in that, okay? In case you get hit with that, you've heard a little bit about it. All right, said so Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Number, verse number three, grace be unto you in peace. Notice the order here. Grace, grace always has to come before you have peace. You never ever in the Bible you see peace come before grace. Grace always comes before peace. Grace being in peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you, given you by Jesus Christ. Paul said, man, I thank God for you. Amen. And I've got written down the byline of my Bible right here. So do I for you people. I thank God for the grace that God gave you. You know what? It helps me to see other Christians, be with other Christians, work with other Christians. I thank God for the grace that he's given you. We need to be thankful for the grace that God has given to each one of us. Hey, we are what we are by the grace of God. Amen. We are what we are by the grace of God. Look in your Bible there, verse number five, that in everything you're enriched by him. In everything you're enriched by him. Oh my goodness sakes alive. If God hadn't enriched my life. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm living at a point in my life. I mean, I'm counting my blessings. I'm having the biggest time you've ever seen. I'm enjoying the fruits of, of, the, of the life live for God. I'm so happy. I'm so thankful. I'm telling you right now, my cup runneth over and I'm not joking you. My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Can I tell you tonight, I have six children and all of them are in church. I have 15 grandchildren. And I'll tell you what, I'm just having the blast of my life. I mean, I'm just honest with you. I look back now and I say, oh, my land, I'm so thankful God saved me. I'm so thankful for the grace of God. I see how God has enriched me by his grace. Well, I, would be, I would be so poor without the grace of God tonight. My life, I'm honest with you. I sat at the table sitting with this lady and she said, she was what she said, how many grandchildren do you have? And I said, 50. She goes, oh, my land, you know. Like, you know. And that's funny how people act like that's a, it's a blessing, not a burden. It's a joy, not a problem. And then, all, then she like looked, and I could see this emptiness in her face. And she says, well, she said, I, I don't have any brothers and sisters, and I don't have any children. You know what she's thinking? Who am I going to have to be around when I'm old? Who do I have? And I'm just saying tonight, that's why you ought to appreciate church. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. Don't take it lightly when you come in church and you see your brother or sister in the Lord and the grace of God that's been given him, and he's enriched us. You know what? My, my fellowship and my brotherhood and sisterhood with you is an enrichment to my life. It is. And the knowledge of the scripture and the wisdom of scripture is an enrichment to my life. Well, anyway, he said uh, in verse number, in utterance and in all knowledge, verse six, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift and waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they knew about the coming of Christ and all those kind of things. And then he kicks in verse number six, who shall, Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end. Oh, isn't that sweet? Who's going to confirm you to the end? He is not the hey, churches have confirmations, don't they? But they're not the confirmers. 
Who's the confirmer? Christ is the confirmer. It's good stuff, amen? It's just assurance, it's blessing. He said, confirm you then, that you may be blameless. Now watch this, he didn't say sinless, he said blameless. Blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's doing the confirming? Who's doing the saving? Who's doing the sainting? Who's doing the sanctifying Christ? He's building this whole thing around Jesus Christ. Verse nine, God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Underline that in your Bible. God is faithful. God is faithful. He's been faithful to me all these years. He's been faithful to you tonight. By whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Man, I'll tell you something. God is faithful. He's faithful to save. He's faithful to sanctify. He's faithful to satisfy. He's faithful to forgive. He's faithful. He said, if you'll confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you for your sins. He's telling them God is faithful. He needs to know that these people are faithful because they were getting messed up and they're having all kinds of problems. Problems in the marriages, problems in the homes, problems with the kids, problems in the church, problems with their money, problems everywhere. Problem in the doctor. He said, hey, wait, 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 wait. God's faithful. God's faithful. He's settling them down. People need to be settled down by the truth of God's word. He said, God's faithful. And he said this, verse number 10, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that y'all speak the same thing. <laughs> oh my goodness. That y'all speak the same thing. There be no divisions. <laughs> among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. So now we're going to all read this together tonight. I think that'd be a good project. Don't you? Everybody ready? Verse number 10. Let's begin to read. Let's begin. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. <clears throat> now, what you just got through experiencing was that verse in a way. In a, just, there's a lot of applications there. But did you know if you all had different versions of the Bible tonight, you could not have spoken the same thing? And it would have sounded like the Tower of Babel here tonight. Oh my goodness, do you think about all these churches who, where you walk into a church, there's seven, eight, six, nine, five, three different versions of the Bible. Did you know they are so in violation of that verse? It's not even crazy. That's just one application. But here's another thing. He said there, he said, he said, speak the same thing. Now here's the deal. He said, all right, we have one Bible. Okay. And he said, if we're all in this Bible, we ought to be speaking the same thing. Okay. I'll be getting along. Now, let me tell you, power comes to a church when a church gets in one accord and one mind. That's why Satan, that's why Paul said, he said, after my departing, he said, there'll be grievous wolves enter into the church, not sparing the flock. What Satan wants is scatter people, scatter people, scatter people, because he weakens the work of Christ. And he weakens. And I'm telling you what, you get a lamb and you get, a, you get them off over here by themselves and off over here. First thing you know, they're devoured and messed up. I've washed it, washed it, washed it, washed it, washed it. And it's, this, this, is, this is good stuff. He said, I, he said, I beseech you. He laid all this stuff out about how Christ is the center of everything and the basis of our salvation and everything. And he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that y'all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, here's a problem. Our flesh is always looking for what we don't agree with other people with. The flesh is wicked as it can be. I'm telling you, as wicked as it can be. It's always looking for, not looking for what we can agree on. But what we can do, I'm going to study Phil a while, see what I can find out I don't agree with him about. Won't take long. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to tell you, you better think, you better think before you walk up somebody and start something. You better ask yourself, is this going to bring agreeance or is this going to bring division? And where am I doing that? Let me tell you something. The stupidest thing you'll ever do is have some kind of discussion with somebody over an issue at church. Do not get on this property discussing your issues. I'm telling you. Amen. Is that the way you want your home? Oh, let's sit around the dinner table, have a big knockdown drag out right here at the house. Let's make some sweet memories at home. Mom and daddy chewing each other out and having a big fight. Oh, swam sweet home. Is that what you want to leave your kids memory with? Let me tell you something I've dealt with is young people who all they can remember is mom and daddy fighting at the dinner table. We couldn't even eat together. Nobody could have their food together. We're in disagreements and disunity all the time. Paul's saying this stuff's going to kill you because they were having problems at this church. They weren't getting along. They were all just fine. They were all picking on each other. I don't like that. And I don't like you. And I don't like you. And I don't like you. And he said, you're going to devour. He said, be, he said, be careful. You consume one another. You bite and devour one another and consume one another. 
Now I'm going to tell you all something tonight. Let's just talk straight. Whether you like it or not, God has chosen to use this church to reach a lot of people. I've got letters at the house. I've got emails at the house from this week. People, I mean, this morning got a text from somebody in South Carolina. We'll be waiting for it to come on. And the church is re reaching a lot of people in various ways. This church is taking a stand. What does Satan want for this church? He wants us all to be divided. Now, I'm just going to say something real straight to you. Now, listen to me tonight. Listen to me good. You know your preacher is not perfect. Amen. You know that. Okay? You know your preacher probably got the worst flesh nature in this church. But I'm going to tell you something. I do have a heart for the Lord's work. I do have a heart for souls. I have a heart for the word of God being proclaimed and published in this country. And I have had for all these years. I mean, we've went... I mean, from newspaper ads, full page ads, half page ads, mail outs, you name it. We've, we've mailed CDs out 25,000 people in this area. I mean, we've done everything we could. We haven't. I mean, if we had it, we tried to do something with it, right? So what's the devil want to do with this church? He wants to tear us up. Let's just, you get honest tonight. Joel, he doesn't want me and you getting along. Jeremy, nothing the devil like any better for me and you to get at odds against each other. Nothing he'd like better. That's just the facts of it. You better get this down. This is Bible. This is not just stuff off. Paul said, listen, he said, I beseech you by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that you be of the same mind and that there be no divisions among you. Now, I'm going to say something. And you're not, some of you are not going to like this. You can take it any way you want to. But we've had trouble in the last four or five years. I've had a lot of trouble. Okay, a lot of trouble. I've had a lot of people leave. I'm going to tell you where it all started. I've never said this, before, but I'm going to tell you exactly where it started. Because I'm getting really, I'm, Lord's really testing me. I'm just getting so weary out of all the talk. They will not let it rest. Started right over there in a the pew on a Sunday night after church. And a person started defiling the people of this church and people that worked hard in this church. And started running them down to me and, and using it as justification what they want to do. And I said, I'm not listening to it. And I got up and walked out of that door and I said, I'm not going to listen to this. You're not going to do that to me. And that fire started and it burned till it burned, burned about 50, 60 people out of this church. And that's what happened. And because I wouldn't bow down and lick their boots. Because I wouldn't cow down. And I said, I don't care who it is in this church. I'm not sitting to listen to you defile and run down another brother and sisters who are working hard and doing all they can and serving God in this church. I'm not listening to it. You're in the wrong. And then all of a sudden I got demonized because I didn't go along with it. I'm a terrible person. That's what happened. Pure and simple. And you get, you, if you get it in your head that you, you know, you're going to get it in for people. I had stuff said to me about people in this church. I mean, I let you know, I've said at kitchen tables and I've had people said to me, I could not believe what I was hearing. I could not believe the venom that they had for people in this church and they were going to church with them. I'm like, what on earth? I had no clue in my head that you thought that way about those people. Everything from the songbook. I've had it all. <laughs> Seriously. This is what Paul's dealing with. And Paul's saying, listen, you guys. Yeah, I know there's some rich folk here. I know there's some poor folk here. There's some slaves here. There's some people that, you know, they're this, that. And he said, there's, there's a whole mix of the Corinthian people. But you people cannot be effective for God unless you stay unified. Amen. If you, and if all you're going to do is come to church and just pick on people and pick out people and what you don't like about them. Did you know I'm honest to goodness? My flesh is so rotten, there's not a soul in this church. But if I looked at you long enough, I'd see something I didn't like about you. I mean, I'm just honest with you. And I'm going to say this to you. You listen to me well. I'm not, I didn't come in on the last load of pumpkins. I may have come in on a load of pumpkins, but not the last load. I can't imagine having sat and listened to me preach for 36 years. I don't know how Mrs. DeGase has done it. Huh? You know why? She loves me. Do you think she's agreed with everything I've preached? Do you think she sits there and says, oh, I love the way he's acting right now? <laughs> no. You know what she knows? You listen to me now. You know what she knows? She knows what Paul knew. There's a higher cause than Reggie here. Amen. There's a higher cause than Reggie's personality. And so if you think that, now, here's what I got to say to you. If you say, Reggie, boy, I tell you what, sometimes you just really grind on me. 
you go try preaching at the same church for 36 years, three times a week for 36 years. See how your personality fits everybody. I'm going to tell you what, God knew all this. He knows all about, see, it's not just, this is in every church you're looking at down the road. I don't care, all over Norwood, all over Wright County, I don't care what, it's the same thing. And until we start learning how to do what 1 Corinthians says and love one another and appreciate and see the bigger picture that Satan is trying, that's what, I'm going to tell you something. Churches, that's why I tell young preachers, I would not probably take a church anywhere. I'm going to tell you why. America has been going along far enough now, there's too many wounds and bruises in the community. There's too many people say, I won't darken the door of that church because of what they did to grandpa back 35 years ago. I just rent me a storefront and start up a church. That's the truth. I, I know a little bit. I mean, I've been around the block. Okay. And what I'm saying to you is this, do I rejoice in that? Have I been right all the time? No, no. I've been wrong many, many times, many times, but I'm going to tell you something. I have to ask myself, Okay, if I decide I'm just going to be contentious and I'm going to be cantankerous and I'm going to be, you know, just uh, I don't like him and I don't like him and I don't like her and I don't like her. You know what I'm saying? I don't care about these kids' the spiritual life. I'm more concerned about my little pet peeve than I am. I, I'm, I don't care if I damage Levi back there and Levi has to. How old are you, Levi? He's 16 years old. You know, you know the last thing he needs. What you what you say? 17. 17. I'm sorry. That is important at 17 years of age, amen. You don't get that wrong. I'm sorry. You're 17. You know the last thing he needs is a 17-year-old young man, Matt? last thing he needs is to see a bunch of Christians fighting and hating each other's guts. That's the last thing that boy needs to see. And a lot of, and, and Brother Caleb got up here the night and talked about how there's only a small percentage of church kids that's going to school now, going to, going to church. You know Why? They've seen too much of it. They're sick of it. They are sick of it. They're sick of the facade, the phoniness. They're sick of people who claim it's supposed to be a, a faith of love, hating each other. Not just hating each other either. Don't care about each other. Don't care. You don't mount anything in my life. I can live without you. Oh my goodness. Anyway, he said they're perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. And the only way to do that is in the same book. The only way to have happen is in the same book. Now everybody stay happy tonight, okay? I'm just preaching truth. Have I preached something right or not tonight? I, I'm just telling you the truth. And let me say something to you. I don't hate anybody that, that gets out of sorts and stuff like that. I, but if I can't agree with it, I just can't agree with it. If you came to me at night and said, Reggie, I'll tell you what, I believe being drunk is a wonderful thing. And I believe every Christian ought to have the right to and I said, I don't agree with you about that. And you got mad at me because I disagreed with you? Ain't there something wrong with that? There's something wrong with that. And I don't have to hate you, just disagree with you. But don't ask me to cow down and don't ask me to back up. But don't ask me to buckle under you just because you've got an agenda of what you want to do in life. Just because you may be... In a, in a spiritual personal mess and you're wanting to go off the deep end yourself and you're wanting to justify why you're wanting to go off on the deep end. Because let me tell you a, a secret of your flesh. In order for your flesh to do what it wants to do, it has to demonize everybody else. If a child is going to get rebellious toward his parents, do you know what a child will do? He'll demonize his mom and daddy every time. If a husband wants to divorce his wife, he will demonize her. He will make her out to be a devil. What they do to Jesus Christ, he has a devil. Whoa. To crucify, watch this, to crucify him, they first demonized him. If a wife wants to leave her husband, what's she going to do to him? She's going to demonize him. Oh, he don't love me. He hasn't done this. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do this. She'll just demonize him to death. Why is she doing that? To justify what she wants to do. And we all do that. So if I, you know, get it in and I, I just, you know, Phil, if I want to try to damage you, I just demonize you. To everybody I'm around. I say stuff. I drop little, I drop little statements. I say what I heard. And I'm going to go back to this and I'll get off of it a little bit. But, you know, the thing I get tired of, and, you know, I'm I, I just part of it, I guess, but I just get tired of people picking on people here in church. You're going to leave this church? Leave. But leave the other folks alone, would you? I mean, I just be honest with you. Leave them alone. Is that fair, just, or not? Amen. I think it is. 
I really think it is. And by the way, this isn't just this church. This is for any church. Any church. And you're not going to find no perfect pastor. And you're not going to find no perfect church anywhere. So we'll get that settled down. And, I, and no preacher is going to find the perfect congregation. Amen. Amen? Right. You got the pastor people like Don Zinn. <laughs> it's a pleasure. See, I want to tell you something. I don't have a problem with Don. Is he abrasive? Can he just, he's like sandpaper. Yeah. Now I want to ask you a question. Why do I love him? Yes, <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Throw him out. Throw him out. Okay. No. <laughs> do you know why I love him? He's my brother. He's my brother. And I'm going to tell you something else. Beyond that, beyond that abrasive exterior, there's a man that really, really loves the Bible and really, really loves the Lord and is very, very appreciative of his salvation. Amen. And I'll tell you one other thing about him. He is as loyal as you get. Amen. And whether you understand this or not, loyalty in Christianity is absolutely critical. So when he's back there and I'm up here and he goes, woo, and everybody, and visitors go. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going, Dawn, they'll never come back. <laughs> and if I would let myself, I'm going to talk to him. Wouldn't do any good. <laughs> I'm telling you, hey, this, think about this. This is the book, 1 Corinthians, that says, Charity suffereth long and is kind, endureth all things, hollers. <laughs> Watch this one here. Watch it. Thinketh no evil. Did you know, I won't be honest with you. I have not. Don, how long you been going to church here? They'll pick on you tonight. 26, seven years. Did you know not one time in my life have I went out during the week and thought evil about you? Not one solitary time that I ever remember it. Do you know why? Because I love him. And love covers a multitude of sin. Love thinketh no evil. It endureth. It suffereth long. <laughs> I kind of got the suffer long thing a little bit down, but the kindness, not there yet, okay? Let's get on down the road, my goodness sakes alive. Verse 11, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of clothes, that, that there are contentions among you. Can you believe that in a church? Now, some of you may be new Christians. You said, oh, I'm going to get saved and go to church, and there'll never be no more problems in my life. We'll all be happy forever. After we all get along wonderful, and everything will be glorious wonderful. Can I tell you, you are walking into <laughs> Briar Patch. When you walk into church, you're walking into Briar Patch. <laughs> he said, there's contentions. Now, there shouldn't be, but we're going to work on it, he said. We're going to deal with it, all right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I always said if I was a judge and people came before me for a divorce, I'd throw them in the jailhouse and say, stay there till you can get along. Did you know they'd get it fixed? They would get it fixed. You say three or four nights, laying there, no blanket. I think pretty soon he'd look over and say, honey, don't you think we'll just kind of forget it? <laughs> she might say, I think we can get along. <laughs> Honestly, you say, well, I just can't get along with him. Yeah, you can. If you love him enough. You love me enough. Oh my. Doesn't mean you're going to agree about everything and you're going to smile every time you see them and you're going to like everything they say or do, but you're going to love them. Hey, just mark your Bible right there. We're quitting. It's 808. Mark it at verse 11. Man, love, I thought I could get through the first chapter tonight. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> ain't happening, is it? Now you mark that because that's where we're picking up next Sunday night. <laughs> 
So I, you guys are just wanting to say, Hallelujah! He didn't finish the first chapter. <laughs> I can just feel it in the congregation. Thank God he didn't finish the chapter. We wouldn't have got out till 10 o'clock. You know, I never will forget, I was preaching one time, I was filling in for church. <laughs> It was in the year and a half that I was gone here and I was feeling that. And man, I was a preacher, you know, and, and for some reason or another, I kind of, I don't know, I was kind of in a different mode and, and I, you know, and they were really, 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 you know, the churches that had the big round clock behind the preacher. You've been to those churches. And I'll never forget there's a guy I went to church with when I was young and he was old and at the preacher, I mean, when it struck noon and that preacher didn't stop, he would turn around, look at the clock and go, You could hear it clear across the church. Of course, everything's quiet as a mouse there anyway. He'd go. <laughs> and that meant it's time for you to shut up. Time to quit. But I never will forget, little old lady comes up to me. Because I'd get all excited and then I'd realize I can't finish it, you know, and I'd be all excited, but I wanted to finish it. And she came up to me one night, at one day after, sun, after preaching on Sunday, she said, Brother Reggie, and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you don't have to finish it. She said, if Jesus comes for next week, said it won't matter anyway. <laughs> Let's stand together and go home, okay?